Father, bless this word into our hearts. Just let it just saturate into us and build up the faith we need to live this life in victory, Lord, in, in, in a victorious way, in a way that just, just ignites us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. I thank you for Joshua, Lord. What an example of, of being able to trust your plan, Lord. Oh, Joshua, sent to do an impossible task, and Lord, you met him on the way, and you said, I got this, Joshua. I got this. And you do have it, Lord. So Lord, as we study this word tonight, and we look at our own lives as obstacles and as walls, Lord, you're the one that could tear down the walls. You're the one that can move obstacles. Lord, you're the one, Lord, that can part the Red Sea. You're the one, Lord God, that can do great and mighty things. Thank you, Lord. So have your way. Fill this word with the Holy Spirit. And use me, Lord, to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That night the king could not sleep. That night the king could not sleep. Now, previously, chapter 5, we have uh, Esther is going to go before the king. This could mean death for her. She, she kind of reasons with, with Mordecai, and Mordecai keeps going back to her and saying, hey, you got to do this. And she goes, well, I can't do this. I can't go before the king. I could die. He goes, listen, you're going to die if you don't go before the king. And God will use somebody else. And she finally decides to go before the king, and she comes before the king. But before she comes to before the king, she tells Mordecai and all the Jews to pray and fast for three days and three nights. And she prays for three days and three nights. Fasts and prays three days and three nights. And on the third day, she comes before the king. And the king has favor for her on, in her. The king has her come into, the, into his presence and he puts out a scepter and she touches the top of the scepter. And we saw last week that royalty touches royalty and grace was imparted. And we saw last week how we saw the picture of the gospel right there in chapter 5 where we saw royalty touches royalty and grace is imparted. We saw how they fasted three days and three nights, how Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights. Uh, we saw the pleading, how she comes and intercedes for the people of God and how Jesus interceded and he still intercedes day and night for the children of God. And we saw all these little pictures and all these beautiful things of how we could see Christ in this beautiful book that doesn't even mention God once. And every time we get to a chapter in this book, we just see God, we see God, we see God, but God's not mentioned, but he is mentioned. He's in full view. He covers the whole book. And it's a beautiful sight. So that night, the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Now, the, the Persians were very good at keeping records. Everything that was written down, everything in the Persian government was written down and, and it was logged and it was kept in a library. There was, every time the king spoke, it was written down. Everything that happened in the Persian empire was written down and, and recorded and logged. And so the king calls for this, this, uh, the records to come. And be read to him. And as the, the reading is occurring to the king, verse 2 it says, And it was found written that Mordecai had told Big Tanu and Teresh, two of the king's Enochs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on the king, King Ahasuerus. And it was found in the Chronicles how these two eunuchs were reported 
by Mordecai that they were going to kill the king. And the king just discovers this. He's like, whoa. Now, when you think about how does the king find this out, Mordecai is praying and fasting. The queen is praying and fasting. All the people of Israel are praying and fasting. And the king just happens to not be able to sleep. And the king just happens to have the chronicles read to him. Just happens by chance. Isn't this a wonderful coincidence that this would actually happen like this? I just, I always see these coincidences in the Bible. Huh. <laughs> I, I really don't even believe in coincidence. God has a plan. I love God's plan. He can't sleep. He can't sleep. We went back and looked at Esther, and she, how did she become queen? She's just a common orphan. She's an orphan girl, a Jew orphan girl, a nobody. How did she become queen? God, the providence of God. How does Mordecai become involved in the story? How does Mordecai able to hear, overhear the eunuchs talking about killing the king? How does that happen? Providence of God. How, did, how is it that Mordecai even stays in Persia when he was able to leave and go back to Jerusalem and help build Jerusalem with Nehemiah and the rest of those guys? How come Mordecai didn't go? Providence of God. And you look at the whole story and you go all the way back how God is always working and moving and his design is perfect. So the king finds out that Mordecai saved his life, basically. Then the king said, what honor or dignity has been restored to Mordecai for this? I mean, who, what have we done for this guy who saved my life? Have we done anything? And the king's servant who attended him said, nothing's been done for him. Not a thing. We didn't do anything. Well, why didn't they do anything? This is an honorable thing. They saved the king's life. Why did they not do anything? Because this had to happen. What, had, what chapter 6 had to happen. That's why nothing was done. There was no way it could be done back then. It had to be done now. And sometimes in your life you're wondering, why isn't it being done now, Lord? It can't be done now. It has to be done then. God's timing is perfect. Perfect. Sorry, I get excited. I do get excited. I, I just like, this is unreal. So the king says in verse 4, who's in the court? Now, Haman, remember Haman? Who's Haman? He's the one that had the king write a decree to kill every Jew in the entire kingdom. The entire kingdom, and we looked at how big the kingdom was. It was huge. The whole Middle East, all the way up to Russia and down into parts of India and Egypt. Giant. All the way up to Asia. Giant kingdom. All the kingdom was going to kill every Jew that could breathe, man, woman, and child. Haman is the one that made the king sign that decree. So the king said, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So Morde Mordecai has just come into the king's vision of being the greatest guy that walks the earth. He saved my life. And the king has no sleep all night and finds this out. And he's so like, we got to do something for this guy. Who's in the court? And he says who's in the court because he, he wants to reason with someone and ask some advice. And why does the king ask advice? 
Because we see that the king has no ability to lead on his own. We saw that through the whole entire story. This guy can't lead. He always has to ask somebody what to do. So he says, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to do what? Suggest that the king do what? Hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared, that Haman had prepared for Mordecai to be hanged. Now, do you remember how tall the, the, the gallows were? 75 feet tall. Now, at that time, 75 feet was tall enough for the entire kingdom to see Mordecai hang. Mordecai was going to be an example. Haman was going to use him for a public display for the whole city to see what we're going to do to these Jews. And he goes in, he's ready, he's waiting in the court, just happens to be waiting in the court when the king is ready to find someone to seek counsel on what to do for Mordecai. He just happens to be in the court at that time waiting to go in and tell the king, we need to hang Mordecai. That's what we got going on so far. The king's servant said to the king, Haman is standing in the court. Did you hear this story so far? Haman is standing in the court. How is that possible that Haman just happens to be standing in the court right when the king is looking to get some advice? The providence of God. See, God is all over the story. And the king said, let him come in. Now, Haman is an evil person. Think about that. He's evil. He's very evil. Mordecai is not evil. Mordecai is a righteous man. He's a good man. And Haman is an evil man. Mordecai is outside the king's palace, praying and fasting in, in sackcloth and ashes. Haman is standing before the, the king himself in a position to influence the king to kill Mordecai. Let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked Haman, what shall be done for a man who the king delights to honor? What shall be done for a man whom the king d delights to honor? This is what he asked Haman. Before Haman ever said anything about hanging anybody, this is the king said, hey, Haman, I want to get your advice. Haman, I, I really seek your wisdom on this. I really need to ask you, what should be done for a man whom the king delights to honor? Now, Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? <laughs> this guy's a piece of work. He's a piece of work. Wow. Wow. Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? I'm the man. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, he thinks it's him. This is how whack this guy is. He thinks it's him. Let the royal robe be brought, which the king was, has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be delivered to the, to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Can you imagine what's going through Haman's prideful heart right now? His hateful heart? Can you imagine what's going on in this guy? He probably turned a different color. 
I bet he came in there all delighted. Ooh, the king's going to honor me. I'm going to get Mordecai hung on the, on the gallows for the whole city to see. This is really great. And all of a sudden, whoa. All the air came out of his balloon. Wow. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe, the horse, as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. You, you, this, you can't even hardly make this stuff up. This is like, look at this story. Look at the timing. Why was Mordecai not honored back then? Because God has a plan. And I don't think Mordecai was worried about being honored as much as Haman was. Who would the king want to delight more than myself? He's full of himself. He's... He's whacked. He took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city, through the city square. This is like the most populated place in the whole city. I think of the city square. Has anybody ever been to a, uh, one of the Central American or South American cities? Almost every city in Central America and South America, even Mexico too, the, the, uh, the Spanish uh, communities, they all have a city square. Every city, no matter how big or small, has a city square. And at night, everybody in the city comes out and just hangs out in the city square. So when I, I saw this in the Bible, I thought, yeah, the city square, that's where everybody goes. So he's on horseback, going through the city square, and, and Haman is now proclaiming before Mordecai. He's Haman, the egotistical maniac, is leading the beautiful horse that the king sat on with Haman sitting on the horse wearing the robe that the king wore, and he's leading this horse proclaiming. Proclaiming. Mordecai hates this guy. He hates this guy. I mean, he really, truly hates this guy. He built a 75-foot gallows to hang him on. He hates him. God is good. God is good. God is good, not because God uh, hurts people, but because God defends the righteous. Don't mess with God's people. You just don't mess with God's people. You don't mess with God's people. Brings him through the city square, proclaiming before him, thus shall be done to a man, to the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. What was he doing in the king's gate? Praying and fasting in, in sackcloth and ashes. Afterwards, after he rode on the king's horse, after he wore the king's robe, after he was, he was magnified before the city, Mordecai does what? goes back to pleading to God. Why is he going back to plead with God? Because there was a decree written by the Persian king that all the Jews would be killed on a such and such a date. That cannot be changed. So it's not like just because he rode on a horse, everything's good. Everything's not good. That's still a decree. That's still, it still must happen. So he goes back to sackcloth and ashes. The story's not over, guys. Hang it thou in there. We got the rest of the story, but just I, I don't want to give it all away. 
So Mordecai goes back to the king's gate, but Haman hurries to his house, mourning with his head covered. Why do you think his head is covered? I, don't, I think he really doesn't want to see his community of, of his peers whom he wants to worship him. I don't think he wants them to see all the tears coming out of his eyes and the sorrow in his face. He can't cry. He can't stop crying. He can't stop weeping. He's falling apart. He's losing his mind. And he's got to cover that. That's my thought. When Mordecai, verse 13, told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Weren't they the ones that gave him the advice to hang him on the gallows? <laughs> they were all wise back then. Now they're getting smarter. They're getting smarter now. They're getting wise. Then he goes back, he tells them the whole story. And they basically tell him, <laughs> You're done. You're done. If everything you told us is true, you're done. And while they are still talking to Haman about this situation of him being done, the king's eunuchs come and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. While they're still talking to him, when he's all in his mood, when he's all wore out, oh, Hammond, don't forget, you have a banquet tonight. <laughs> well, at least I got that. Little does he know, chapter 7 is coming. At least I got that banquet that I was bragging about just the other day. Remember how he was gloating and bragging about how the queen invited him to the banquet and how special he was and how wonderful his house was and how rich he was. And Remember he was bragging about who, how wonderful he was? Remember that? Well, chapter 7 is coming. He's a wicked man with a wicked plan. But no matter how wicked your plan is, God's plan will always, always take first place. There may be wicked people in your life. Maybe there's wicked people you know. Maybe there's wicked people that you think about. How could they get away with this? How can they get away with this? You know, you think of these atrocities, these, these three men that came out of that white car this week. And just shot down two dozen people, killing several of them. How does someone get away with that? You think about these dictators. You think, you know, the North Korea and China and, and these places where, how do these dictators get away with this? How, how can they have this much power? How can they be doing these things? The wicked will never prevail. Never. I want to take you to Psalm chapter 37. We'll start in verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers. I don't think Christians live a Christian life. I cannot understand why Christians get so caught up in the world. 
and let it affect them the way they do. It doesn't make sense to me. Have we forgotten who our daddy is? Have we really forgotten who our daddy is? You know, when we were little kids, man, we, we just don't mess with me, man. You know who my daddy is? You don't want to mess with me. You know who my daddy is? Why do we let circumstances rob the glory of God that abides within us? Why do we let circumstances steal our joy? You know, joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, gentleness. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That, lives, those, that fruit lives inside of us. It abides in us day and night. How do we let the world steal that? from us as Christians. You know, I've told you several times that I'm a hyper-optimist. But the only reason I'm an optimist is because I know the Word of God. If you know the Word of God, how can you not be an optimist? And if you're a pessimist, then you're a pest to the body of Christ. We're we're to encourage each other and build one another up in the faith, right? Well, if you're a pessimist, how are you going to do that? How are you going to build one another up in the faith? My God is able to provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That's a fact. It's in the book. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us. That's in the book. I don't understand. That's just verse 1. Verse 2 says, For they shall soon be cut down like grass. Who are they? The evildoers, the, the workers of iniquity. They will soon be cut down like grass. Where's Hitler? He's cut down like grass. They all get cut down like grass. Where's Pharaoh? He's cut down like grass. For they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. I love that right there. Feed on his faithfulness. If you're going to feed on the on, on, on the, the news. Good luck. Good luck. I can't watch it anymore. I just can't watch it. Why am I going to feed on something I can't trust? I can trust the word. I can trust his faithfulness. I'll feed on his faithfulness. I can trust that. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell, on, dwell in the land and feed on his, in, on his faithfulness. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5, commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall what? Bring it to pass. He shall, she shall... He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the moon day. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of men who bring wicked schemes to pass. Oh, people, people, people. You got to let all that baggage go. God has a plan. God really does have a plan. Stop driving yourself crazy. And stop driving us crazy. God has a plan. And I love it. There's peace in that. Verse 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. 
How many of you get all upset when you watch the news? Yeah, yeah, you watch the news, you get upset. Come on, let's be honest. You watch the news, you get upset. They tell you about this and they tell you about that, you get upset. You get all wigged out, you get all stressed out. The sky is falling. It's the end of the world. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. What harm does it cause when you cause you when you fret? What harm is there? Stress, fear, anxiety, despair, anger, frustration. Do any of those things sound like the fruit of the spirit? None of it. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill what? The lust of the spirit, the lust of the flesh, anxiety, anger, frustration, all that ugly stuff, wrath. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall not be be no more. Next week, we're going to see that in Haman. You're going to look for his place, and you will see it no more. He's a wicked man. He's a wicked man that thinks he has a plan that's going to work. He's a wicked man who is scheming and plotting. He thinks his fulfillment of joy is about to come. But yet he forgot there's a living God that has a greater plan than that Hammond could ever have. You know, when I look at the world's events and I look at politics and I look at what's going on throughout the whole world, I look at the chaos, I look at the condition of the, the cultures that are deteriorating, I look at this whole crazy world that we live in, and I don't have to worry. I don't. If I die from any of that, if any of that takes me out, guess where I am? In paradise. I'm in paradise. Choose joy. You know, James told us so clearly, just count it all joy when you have to deal with all this crazy stuff. Knowing that all this crazy stuff is producing in you patience. But let the patience have its perfect result, that you might be mature and fully equipped for every good work. Let it be, let it come. God's in control. God has a plan. Commit your way, verse 5. Wait, no. I'm moving on. Okay. Verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The meek shall inherit the earth and and delight themselves in an abundance of peace. Now, who are the meek? What does meek mean? It's power under control. That's what meek is. It's power under control. You Christians have a lot of power. Now control it. Let the Holy Spirit have you. Let it be controlled. You have power, and you have the power to not have to stress over evildoers. Verse 12 says, The wicked plot against the just and gnash at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. Does that remind you of Haman? The Lord laughs at him. And sees that his day is coming. Why is the Lord laughing at him? Because the Lord's not stressed about it like you. We get so stressed out. We let everything eat us up. Everything. Verse 14. The wicked have drawn the sword. And have bent their bow. To cast down the poor and needy. To slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart 
and their bows shall break, shall be broken. That sounds like Hammond. Wait till next week. A little that the righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Verse 17. The arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the day of famine they shall, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked, they will perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the, of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke, and they shall vanish away. Wow. I truly, truly hope that tonight's message was able to set you free. Esther is the greatest book in the Bible if you want to be encouraged to know that God has a plan. It's a great book. And next week's going to be good. Next week's going to be really good. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you always show up. You do, Lord. I get excited that you show up. I get fired up, Lord. You show up and you encourage us. You set us on the right path. Lord, you are that light to our path. You are the lamp to our feet. You guide the way, Lord. You show us where the things are that would cause us to stumble. You show us the right road to travel on, Lord. You're a good God, and you love us. You're madly in love with us. You, you think about us constantly, and you're faithful and you intercede for us. And you're for us and not against us. And you're always, always, always working the greatest plan for our lives for your good pleasure. Lord, you're a good God. And we will never, ever stop praising you. Father, be with us this week. And let our conduct be the, be the example or the light that shines before all men. That they can see our confidence in you. They can see our trust in you. That, Lord, we don't have to be caught up like the rest of the world in despair. But we can be caught up in hope of a glorious God. Be with us this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys.